We're gonna get to some of these passages in just a moment. James chapter one is where I want you to hold. And uh, I also want you to hold Joshua chapter five. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I wanna speak today, part two. Thank you so much, Fed, you're the best. Make some noise for Fed, I love this man of God. Uh, I wanna speak today from the subject, the challenge is the change. The challenge is the change. And uh, today we are in part two of a collection of talks that I kicked off last Sunday entitled Mature Me. Now, the title itself is twofold. Number one, when we say mature me, it's a prayer. God, mature me in 2024. I don't know about you, but I, I wanna grow this year. I wanna grow physically. I wanna grow emotionally. I wanna grow mentally. I certainly wanna grow spiritually. Someone said amen out there. It starts with a prayer, God, mature me. But the second part of this title is actually a question that you are to ask yourself. What would the mature me do? The question itself is a mature question because when you start asking yourself that question, how many of y'all know that the mature you many times is gonna go against the immature you? You start asking that question and it's going to challenge your flesh. It's going to challenge your default settings. It's going to lead to some other actions. I think everyone starts a brand new year with this desire to change. But if you're going to change, you're gonna have to embrace the pain of change. I'm reminded of that historical account of the famous artist who painted the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo. There was this story where one day he was chipping away at this big shapeless piece of rock and a bystander walked by and said, hey, old Michelangelo, what are you doing? In this man beating against this rock, he said, I am liberating an angel from the stone. And I like it because you need to know that's what God is doing in your life. God is chipping away at some of the rough patches and God is dealing with some of the debris in your life because there's a design. He's getting past some of the clutter and he's creatively making you into the person he's called you to be. He's developing you into the person he designed you to be. He's gotta chip some stuff away. I don't know where you came from or what you've heard, but sometimes in church we can kind of like fall into these little cliches. God accepts you just the way that you are. True-ish. <laughs> you ever heard that term, ish? It's too early for that. Um, God loves you just the way that you are, but you better know that we serve a good father. And the good father is not satisfied with leaving you the way that he found you. He loves you so much, come on somebody, that he's gonna do some work, that he's gonna liberate the real you. What I know about change is this, is that if it doesn't challenge you, it will not change you. If it doesn't challenge you, then it will not change you. And if God is going to mature you in 2024, he's gonna have to challenge you. I think this is why the brother of Jesus wrote it this way, James chapter one, we looked at it a little bit of it last week, but he says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be, here's the word, everyone say mature. So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Listen to me, God trains you through trials. God allows things in our life like trials and challenges to chip away at us so that we might become mature. I have three children, and uh, my oldest son, his name's Wyatt, and Wyatt is getting ready to turn six in about, oh, I can't believe it, nine days. And Wyatt, if I'm gonna be honest with you, was the easiest baby ever. Like, the kid was, just, it's just the, my, my best friend. He's just so... Firstborn, responsible, yes, dad. He wants to please his father. He's just the, he's amazing. And when I was thinking about like, his like early, early years as a baby, like the only time this kid would really ever cry was through this, um, this exercise called tummy time. Some of the parents know what I'm talking about. Tummy time is this really weird thing that like if you're brand new to parenting, you're like, really? This sounds awful. But essentially that you allow your baby to lay on their belly and it's this moment called tummy time but during tummy time, Wyatt would freak out. He'd scream. And now he had no words, but when he would cry, all I could picture him saying was, Dad, 
if you really loved me, <laughs> you would spare me from all of this trouble. Yeah. I'm laying here in my belly. Pick me up. But what you know about tummy time, if you're a parent, is actually the most loving thing I could ever do is allow him to go through the trouble of laying on his belly. Why? Because tummy time is an exercise that a child learns how to lift up their neck. Listen, if they don't learn how to lift their neck, they ain't gonna learn how to sit up. If they can't sit up, they can't stand up. If they can't stand, they can't walk. If they can't walk, they can't run. If they can't run, they can't jump. Yo, if Wyatt can't jump, how on earth are the Miami Dolphins ever gonna win a playoff game? <laughs> Somebody said amen. <laughs> I'm training this boy. I'm his father. The most loving thing I could ever do is allow him to go through the momentary trouble that he might be trained. Think about it. If this kid doesn't ever go through tummy time, he's gonna spend the rest of his life in tummy time because there's stages and there's growth and God takes the trials and says, I have a plan with it. Trouble, my friends, is training you. Challenge is changing you. And God, he says, I want to train you in 2024 and the way I'm gonna liberate the real you, the mature you, is that I'm gonna allow you to go through some tough stuff and some difficulty. But please understand today that if you can get some conviction in this room, that the pain has a plan. If you could understand, you don't have to give up under pressure. You don't have to give up under stress. You don't have to quit. God is working something through your life. If he's ever gonna trust you, he's gonna have to give you a trial and he's gonna have to test you. May I say it this way? That God saves his toughest assignments for his most trusted servants. I want to be used by God. Is there anybody in 2024? I know in our church, there's got to be somebody that would say, God, I want to be used by you. Can you put your hands together right now? Let's just build some faith in the room. I want to be used by God. And God says, I'm going to test you that I might trust you. Last week, we started looking at this man in the Bible. His name is Joshua. And uh, he's one of my favorite Bible characters. I don't like that word character. He was a real person. He's not like a Disney person. He's, he's a real guy. He really lived, you know. Mickey, um, no, he's a real guy. But um, he's one of my favorite people in the Bible. And we started kind of giving you glimpses of his, of his beginning of his story. And even today, uh, th there's too much in this entire book. I wish I could preach it just honestly line by line, but we would be here all the way through June. Today, I want to show you a, a few moments from his life. But, but last week, just to kind of pick us up, uh, back into context a little bit, I preached a message called The Promise is the Plan. Because what we see about Joshua is that we catch Joshua as we open up this book in the Old Testament in a really unique moment. He is filling in, he's filling the shoes of Moses, maybe the greatest, one of the greatest leaders we ever saw in the Bible. He's the man who led the Israelites out of slavery of Egypt. And Joshua is now stepping in. He was the aide of Moses, but now he's becoming the leader of Israel. It's important because maturity is always seen in how we handle transitions. How you transition in life. Life is full of transitions. And we're getting to watch Joshua as he is stepping into a big transition. And when God comes to speak to Joshua, he doesn't give him this perfect plan. Instead, he gives him a promise. The promise is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so it is for you and I that when we step into moments, we don't always get a playbook, but we always get a promise. That God says, no matter what you go through, I will be with you, and that is enough for the day. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 1, as you go into Joshua 2, all the way through verses 4, what you're going to see is you're going to see that Joshua leads the people of Israel across the Jordan River. Now, I wish we had time to preach about it. It's a really cool moment because Joshua, he leads the Israelites across the Jordan River, and just like God parted the Red Sea for Moses, God stops the river flow of the Jordan. Remember in Joshua chapter one, he promised Joshua, I will be with you just like I was there for Moses. But now, as we pick up today in Joshua chapter five, what we're gonna see is, is that they've crossed over the Jordan River and now they are on the outskirts of the promised land. This is the place that God has promised them. And I wanna show you that as Joshua is maturing, like you and I, he's gonna face some challenges. And today I wanted to show you three challenges that we'll all face 
on the journey of maturing, and we're gonna look at it from the life of Joshua. Here we go. Joshua chapter five, verse 10. If you're there, say I'm there. This is the early service, we gotta hurry. Are you there? Perfect. Joshua, if you're not, we're gonna move on without you. Joshua chapter five, verse 10. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal, on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Verse 12, that's what I want you to see. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Challenge number one. The first challenge that we have to all face as God changes us is the challenge of habit. The challenge of habit. Here's what I want you to see. The Bible says that as the Israelites left Egypt, they were led by Moses. But if you know the story, God has promised them a place. It's the promised land. It's the area of Canaan. Scripture says that as they get into the wilderness, this journey really should have taken days, if not a few weeks. It ended up taking them 40 years. I don't know if you know why that is, but the Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Because they disobeyed God. And God said, because of your disobedience, not one of you will inherit the land that I promised you. It's not until you are all dead that your kids will get the thing that I promised. So what I want you to see in the text is that 40 years have passed, and now this is the very beginning of the promise starting to be fulfilled. You say, Rich, why are you saying that? What I want you to see is, is that these kids, they were born in the wilderness, but they've grown up as warriors. They were living in exile, but now they're about to be landowners. <laughs> these guys were wanderers, and now they're about to be kingdom builders. What's the point? The point is, is that where you started is not always where you're gonna end up. The point is, is that you might have begun in a bad place, woo, but God's got a good place in store for you. Can I encourage some people? Stop thinking in days. Start thinking in decades. Everyone's thinking four years. Nah, nah, nah. The mature me starts thinking 40 years. What could God do in 40 years. You might not be there yet, but we serve a God who always comes through on his promise. Don't give up as you're on the journey. The Bible says, watch this, this is so incredible. The Bible says that they get there. This is the first time now that their feet, they've crossed the Jordan River. Now their feet are on the outskirts of the promised land. And notice what the scripture says. The scripture says that it's in that moment that as they get to that land, that on that day they ate produce from the land of Canaan, and on that day, the manna stopped. The manna stopped. God stopped sending manna from heaven. Why would that be? I'll tell you why it is. It's because miracles are for saving. They're not for sustaining. I gotta get this into some, this, this is a mature me message. Miracles are for saving, they're not for sustaining. Remember, um, Jesus, he, he walked on water once to save the disciples from drowning. God shut the mouths of the lions once so that Daniel wouldn't be eaten. What I've learned about people is that some of us are so immature that we are asking God to do things that we have the power to do. I know, it's too early for this, but it's okay. You know, I, I, I want to lose weight. Yeah, but you haven't changed your diet. I want to get fit. Yeah, but you still haven't gone to the gym. I want to get out of debt. Yeah, but you keep buying things that you want, not what you need. We can go through, I want to get a job. Yeah, but you still haven't applied. I want Christian friends. Yeah, but you only go to church when it's convenient. <laughs> What I'm trying to get you to see is that the mature me recognizes that, hey, I'm gonna step into something new. In the moment that they got to the outskirts of the promised land, God said, I want to give you land to tend to. I don't want you to get miracles to live on. This is important. Watch this. They're stepping into a brand new habitat. And the new habitat calls for a brand new habit. 
See, new places require new plans. New seasons require new strategies. But some people want a miracle from God, but they don't want to form a habit. They had a habit of being in the wilderness. There's no way to plant crops in the desert. So God, rich in mercy, God omnipotent, full of power, so the people wouldn't be malnourished and die, he sent Holy Spirit Pop-Tarts from heaven. We call it manna. And every morning they had to rely upon God and they got manna to eat. But the moment, the very moment that they stepped onto brand new land, God said, all right, the manna stops because the manna was the old miracle. The promised land is the new miracle. It's the challenge of habit. It's the challenge of habit. It reminds me of what Paul said. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. He said, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, where's all the men at? <laughs> Come on, man, help me out. <laughs> Watch out, where's all the women of God at in this house? I said, when I became a man, When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood <laughs> behind me. Manna was for a moment. Milk for a child is for a season. It was for saving. It wasn't for sustaining. And so many of us, we got to awaken to this, that man, I've touched my feet on the promised land. And God says, I brought you here by my mercy and by my grace, but I'm bringing you to a place where you can produce for yourself. And it's real scary because missing manna will keep the Israelites out of the promised land. Just like for their parents, missing Egypt kept them from ever getting their feet onto the ground. What are you missing today? Some of you, you are so content with old miracles and God's going, I got, I got new miracles for you. But the new habitat requires a new habit. Some of us, we got a bad habit. Here's the bad habit. Huh, we're just so used to getting fed. But yo, you need to form a good habit in 2024. You need to learn how to make your own meal. This is the year that some of you are gonna actually have to open up this book you're gonna actually have to get a promise for yourself. You're gonna have to start reading this thing. You can't just come and serve because your friends are serving. You can't just worship because it's a gathering. You're gonna have to learn in 2024 how to worship all by yourself. You're gonna have to learn how to cry out to God when nobody else is around. Come on, can I get a witness in the house today? This is the year of maturity. It's important because when crisis hits, you are reduced to your habits. You're reduced to your habits, your habits. They had an old habit of God feeding them in the wilderness, but now in the promised land, they have to make their own food. It's not because God doesn't have more miracles. No, God's got many more miracles, which we will see, but he wants to do miracles. He doesn't want you to rely upon old ones. Someone say the challenge of habit. It's not just the challenge of habit. Number two, the second challenge that Joshua was gonna have that we're gonna have to all be challenged with is the challenge of truth. The challenge of truth. Everyone say the challenge, the challenge of truth. Listen to me. Joshua gets to the outskirts, but their very first challenge awaits them. They pass the Jordan River, but now as they come in, they're on the outskirts of this area called Jericho, and there are these large, fortified, impenetrable walls known as the walls of Jericho. And someone needs to get it in their heart today that just because you have a promise doesn't mean that you don't have a problem. I don't know who lied to you. I don't, I've got problems. It's because you've got a promise. The bigger the promise, the bigger the problems. Don't, don't, don't let the khaki pants and the master shirt fool you. I got all sorts of problems. Why? Because I've got all sorts of promises from God. He's chipping some things away at my life. Watch this. This is what happens. Joshua, he's got his people, and there's the story of Rahab and the spies. Go back, read it, Joshua chapter two and three. But let's pick up right here in Joshua chapter five. This is amazing. The Bible says in verse 13, when, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, 
Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing on is holy. And Joshua did so. I want you to see this because this is so good. This is the challenge of truth. Joshua is roaming around the campground and he encounters a man. Now, it's ironic because Joshua approaches this man who is God and he comes to this man and demands an answer from the man saying, whose side are you on? Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Are you for Israel or are you for Jericho? Because Joshua just knows, right? Joshua just knows that he's on the right side. How many of y'all know that we all down deep kind of think that we're always right? Like most of us, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you kind of fake humble, yeah, 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 I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> See, the immature version of you is always right, but the mature version of you has to admit, sometimes I'm wrong. Right. Right. We have to be challenged with the truth. We are in a very unique season as a church right now. If you're just joining us or watching online here in Miami, Florida, God is doing something. Last Sunday in particular was historic. 7,500 people in church, four locations. God, come on, let's give God some praise in this room. Absolutely, let's give God some praise. It, it, it's amazing what God is doing. And I would actually even say that we are in a season of harvest. But what a lot of people don't realize about harvest is that harvest is heavy. When a tree bears fruit, how many of y'all know that tree begins to bend? Because the fruit is heavy. And all of a sudden, when you step into harvest, how many of y'all know that there becomes, the, the pressure is a privilege, but it doesn't negate the effect of the pressure. That life is going to squeeze us, and the question when you get squeezed is, what's going to come out of you? And so we're in the midst of God doing amazing things, but I'm not going to lie to you, this past week, I kind of had a weak moment. What wasn't dramatic, wasn't bad, but just a weak moment just kind of had a bad attitude, really on the inside. I don't know if everyone could even see that I had, a, I had a bad attitude on the inside with some of our team and just, you know, just, mm, you know, just, uh, well, I'm hanging low, you know? <laughs> and uh, I woke up the next morning. I don't know if this has ever happened. I just woke up the next morning. I was like, oh, man, your attitude sucks, Rich. And so I asked myself that question. It's a dangerous one. What would the mature Pastor Rich do? <laughs> And right away, I knew what the answer was. I was confronted with the truth. You got to apologize. And so I just shot some texts off going, yo, I apologize, man. Some people are like, what are you talking about? My God, just, it wasn't you, it's me. You know, like, what are we breaking up? You know, like, <laughs> you can help me, Fed. I love it. Um, it, it like, it's, it's, it's not you, it's, it's me. I, I just apologized. Yeah. You say, why are you telling that story? I'm just telling you because as we mature, we have to be confronted with the truth. And the truth requires self-awareness. Self-awareness means I'm aware of my weaknesses, I'm aware of my strengths, but maturity requires like empathy, like I can see it from your vantage point. So here's Joshua, just get this. Joshua is like, hey, whose side are you on, man? Now, the theological word is, this is called a theophany, a theophany. There's these glimpses of these moments in the Old Testament where Jesus himself shows up on the scene. This is one of those moments. It's one of my favorite Old Testament stories because here's Jesus right there, right before they go to the battle of Jericho. And Joshua, who is so mature, is definitely sure, yo, are you on my side or are you on their side? I don't know about you, but I just think it's like such a picture of humanity. Or at least let me just speak towards the culture of America. We are a polarizing people. Everything's black or white and we just always know the truth, don't we? It's either grace or it's truth, whose side? Israel or Jericho? I know I represent God. So God, tell me as I represent you, whose side are you on? Did you hear the answer? The answer from the Lord is neither. What? Some of you are like, this is not the truth I want. <laughs> neither. And as soon as he says neither, the truth pierces Joshua's heart that he falls down and says, tell me what you command. 
And what does God say? God reenacts the same moment that Moses had from a burning bush. Remember when Moses got to the burning bush and Moses has to take his shoes off because he's standing on holy ground? God says, take your shoes off. You don't know where you're standing. See, what God is saying is God is saying, I'm not on Jericho's side and I'm not on Israel's side. But the truth of the matter is, Joshua, is the mature question is never asking God to be on your side. The mature question is, am I on God's side? Am I on the Lord's side? See, we're gonna have to get this as a church that Christianity is not about us getting our agenda accomplished. Christianity is not about me getting my dream fulfilled. Christianity is about fulfilling the dream that God has. Christianity is about God. God, what is your agenda? I don't want to go one step thinking that I, just because I represent you, am always right. A lot of times I'm wrong, so what do you want? I'm not trying to get God to agree with my words. I'm trying to get my words in agreement with God. I want to speak what he's saying. This is not about establishing our kingdom. We got lots of vision in this house. Let me just say it. We are not trying to establish the kingdom of Vu. We are here for one reason, to be challenged with the truth of God's word. We want to establish his kingdom that long after we're gone, people are still telling stories about his faithfulness, his goodness, and his mercy. Come on, somebody. Anybody believe it today? And I want to encourage our church that when you get confronted with the glory of God, when you get challenged with the glory of God, whoa, this is God. Some of us, we walk around, we're like, he's on my side. Make sure you're on his side. Because when you get confronted with the glory of God, watch this, you recognize very quickly, this is not about your story. And some of you, this is a truth that's gonna help you as you mature. It's not, a, it's not about your story. Someone's gotta tell you, because like six days of, on YouTube all week long, it's your story, your, your business, your brand, you, 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 individualism, you, man, make your million, man, get your brand out there. But, but, but when you get confronted with the glory of God and the shoes have to come off, you're like, whoa, this is holy ground. His glory always tells me this is about his story. And one of the most challenging things you can do in your life, but it will change you is to start writing your story with God as the main character. Am I? Am I on your side? Lord, left to myself, I make poor decisions. So I want to be challenged with the truth. I have to be challenged with my habit. I have to be challenged with the truth. And then last, look, look at this, this is good. I think the whole book of Joshua could actually be this last point. We have to be challenged with obedience. It's the challenge of obedience. It's the challenge of obedience. Because God begins to speak to Joshua and here comes the command that he gives Joshua. This is Joshua chapter six, verse two. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Someone say six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark, and on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. I want you to see this because the Lord gives him a specific command. God says, I want you to go to Jericho, but I want you to listen to my battle plan. What I wanna to say to you about obedience that's really important is that you don't actually know if you've ever obeyed someone or something until, number one, you do something you don't wanna do, and number two, you do something, but you don't understand why you're doing it. You wanna know about obedience? I, I love people, they get saved, it's like six months in, it's like, I'm so obedient. Like, bro, everything you've done so far, you wanted to do. You got a community. You got to sing the song, that's fun. But, but Christianity and following Jesus is about an obedience that, yo, I don't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yo, I don't wanna do what he's asking me to do. Look at this, because 
We read the Bible, we miss it. God's like, Joshua, here we go. Get ready. I got a battle plan for you. He's like, yeah, yeah, all right, let's go. What's the battle plan? Check this out. I want you to get all those people and I want y'all to um, zip your lip and start marching. Okay. And then what? When, when, do we get the swords? Nah, you don't need swords. Okay. okay. Um, spears. Nah, no spears. Okay. Okay. I, I feel you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. What about, what about probably bows and arrows? Nah, forget the bows. Forget the arrows. What? Okay. What, what do we need? Gr- uh, grab some instruments. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. Get the choir. Listen to the ridiculousness of this battle plan. I want you to get everybody, and I want you to quietly, in plain sight, march around the walls of Jericho. How many of y'all know that God's battle plan always looks different from your battle plan? You and I, we want to go and curse them. God's like, no, go in, bless it, bro. Y'all want to go and cuss it. Oh, I'm going to get him. I'm gonna... No, no, God's like, start smiling. I want, I'm gonna, you know what, I want to post. I want to post. No, 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 Let it go. Let it go, let it go. No, 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 I want to get them. God's like, no, 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 forgive them. See, the battle plan of the Lord is always different from your battle plan. But how many of y'all know, many of us, we don't fight like God because we don't think we will win with his strategy. Some of you have all been on three different marriages because you won't take the strategy of God. Some of you have burned every deep friendship because you won't follow the strategy of God. Some of you, I love you, I'm so glad you're coming to VU, welcome, we're glad. But yo, unless you actually start obeying God, this will be, like every other place you've gone to, another church on your journey. Because the moment I say something you don't like, we're out, the dude with the master sweater, bro, he's mean. But you never stayed anywhere long enough to tend to the land, to see the promise of God because you don't understand his battle plan. His battle plan is different from yours. His strategies are different. I know, I know. Some of you today, it's like, yo, but I'm out here marching and I'm ready to shout. I'm out here marching and I'm, I'm ready for like accolades. I'm ready for vengeance. I'm ready for recognition. I'm ready for celebration. I'm ready for advancement. How long I gotta march, Rich? Some of us, we're just marching and we're marching and we're marching. And as we march, it seems like there are massive walls in front of us that will not come down. And I hear you and I sympathize with you and I empathize with you, but I know this to be true. If God says seven, don't do six. If God told you seven, don't give him six. Keep on marching. It's the journey of faith. Keep on marching. I know we look silly out here in plain sight, just walking around. What you doing? I'm marching. What you doing? I'm fighting. What you doing? I'm obeying God. It can feel silly obeying God. It can look ridiculous obeying God. When I was a kid, sometimes my parents would give me a command and I was always smart. Why? And if you had a mama like me, she'd be like, because I told you. Sometimes, um, Parents say that, let's just be honest, because they're lazy. (laughs) But a lot of times parents say that because I don't have the time in this moment, it's so urgent to explain to you the reason. Or watch this, you're too immature at this moment to understand the command. But just because you can't understand it, I'm preaching to myself, doesn't mean that it's any less true. God says, for six days, keep your mouth shut. Why do you tell them to keep their mouth shut? Well, because these are the children of complainers. And what you watch is what you repeat. So God was real specific. I want you to go out there, march. You don't need no weapons. Just march. But one thing, keep your mouth shut. Why? Because Jericho is not your problem. Those walls aren't your problem. The problem is that little tongue of yours that is like a wildfire 
that as you start opening up your mouth, you can sow such seeds of disobedience in the camp. And just like your parents and your grandparents, that voice of complaining can start to sweep through and that will be the thing that will prevent you from moving forward. So do me a favor, be quiet, shut your mouth. There's actually a miracle in progress. And if you'll just be quiet, you're gonna see victory come your way. Look at your neighbor and say, shh. Look at your neighbor and say, there's a miracle in progress. Shh. One of the best things you could do in 2024 is just be quiet. Close your mouth. Keep on marching. Don't stop marching. Keep on doing what God told you to do. If he told you seven, don't you stop at six. I can't help but think about tomorrow it being Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And I'm reminded of that march from Selma to Montgomery, 56 miles, bloody Sunday, where they showed up on a bridge and on national television that these people are just marching for civil rights. They are beaten to a pulp and there was national outrage. But what I'm reminded about these men and women who just marched is that while they marched, they sang a great song. They sang, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. And what they give us is they give us a picture of what it looks like to obey a call to keep on marching, even though it looks like we're continuing to suffer. If God told you to do something, you keep on doing it. I, I know you're in a situation right now and it seems like you're going in circles around the walls, but please be reminded, you might feel like you're going in circles, but God records the steps. God knows how many steps you have taken. I know it seems like another big repeat year, but God is the one who has orchestrated the routine. I know all you can see is walls, but there is a God high in heaven who sees beyond the walls, plains and plains of promised land, and he says, march! Keep on marching because we too shall overcome. If we're obedient and if we trust, and the Bible says it so beautifully. God says, when you get to that seventh day, I want you to march seven times. And when the priests blow the trumpets, I want you to shout unto God. Can I remind you that seven is the number of completion. Obedience doesn't just start stuff. Obedience finishes stuff. Obedience isn't about flattery words. I'm not into words of flattery. I'm into steps of dedication. I'm out here marching. I'm out here believing. I'm out here trusting. And I'm not gonna give up until I see what God has promised me. Some of y'all need to get a revelation because I think this is exactly how God wants us to worship him. God wants us to obey him, to worship him in spirit. Here it is, and truth. For the Bible says on that seventh lap around, as they shouted, those walls came crashing down and Israel overtook Jericho. Why? Because the Lord fought their battle. They didn't need all the weapons. All they needed was their worship because worship works. And you and I in 2024, we're gonna worship God and we're gonna be obedient. Some of you go, oh, man, y'all up there just singing. I don't think we're just singing. I think every time we come into this room carrying a heavy heart, going, man, I feel like this thing I'm doing out here doesn't make much sense. I feel like there's walls in front of me, but every time I lift up holy hands, every time I shout unto God, even though I don't feel it, I think we're tearing down some walls. I think some walls are coming down. Some walls in your marriage, come on, somebody. Some walls in your finances. Anybody believe some walls are coming down in your family as we worship God? We worship him and we trust him and we believe in him. As we obey God, we too, we shall overcome. Dr. King died before he ever saw his dream come to pass. And in many ways, that dream is still coming to pass. But we can never negate the seeds that he sowed that creates freedom for so many more people. 
And the faith journey is not always about seeing the promise fulfilled in your lifetime. The faith journey is about playing your part. You started this year going, God, I want you to change me. Well, check it out. Do you have any challenges? Yeah. The challenge is the change. Hey, this is Rich and Don Sheree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we want to walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor. If it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to come. come.